Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your lovely introduction. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk uh, um, to be included in such a stunning list of speakers. And thank you all for joining my lecture. Um, let me first introduce uh, what I'm doing and why this lecture and the topic. Well, uh, this lecture is part of a project I'm currently carrying out entitled Galateo, which should be okay, whose acronym means Good Attitudes for Life in Assyrian Times, Etiquette and Observance of Norms in Male and Female Groups. The project aims to understand anew the importance of etiquette in late Assyrian society and to investigate through a multidisciplinary approach the extent to which etiquette influenced the subsequent cultures of the Middle East. Specifically, the chief research goal of Galateo is to develop an adaptable sociological and anthropological theoretical model for the study of etiquette in the ancient Middle East. When we read or hear the word etiquette, several episodes and rules automatically come to our minds. For example, some table manners, uh, such as don't text at the table or keep your elbows off the table. Or in the eighth lane, such as keep your shoes on or at least your socks and wait your time to get off the plane. We certainly have an abundance of examples which lead to the common definition of etiquette as the conduct or procedure required by good breeding or prescribed by authority to be observed in social or official life. However, there is first a problem in using the word etiquette in ancient context, such as the Near Eastern one. Etiquette is in fact an anachronism. It existed in France already at the end of the 17th century, whose old French term estiquette meaning label, ticket, came to have the meaning of prescribed behavior. The sense of development in French perhaps is from small cards written or printed with instructions for how to behave properly at court and or from behavior instructions written on a soldier's billet for lodgings. It then appears in Europe in the 18th century, first as a court protocol then with an extended meaning of conventions for the social life of high society. The second sense emerges in the second part of the 18th century. The first etiquette books emerged simultaneously in the United States, in England and France in the first decades of the 19th century. Despite its anachronism, scholars researching pragmatics and etiquette of politeness have recently tried to define etiquette as an analytical scientific concept, adopting an ethic and not emic perspective, and suggest that the word should indicate a fixed code of conventions, tendentially amoral, and thus it could be used universally. In essence, for a Nick Noster, it is a matter of defining well the use of three concepts. Courtesy, conduct, etiquette. Courtesy would be the superior term that includes two fields. Conduct, which is moralizing and that has more generic, simple behavior rules. And etiquette, which is amoral and has fixed, complicated, detailed rules. In such a terminological issue, we have to consider the word ritual, for which understanding I mostly rely on Daniel Kandar's explanation, who deals with politeness in language. In fact, in many settings, perhaps most typically formal or institutionalized, the interactants are expected to follow certain scripted expectations. In such context, etiquette tends to follow certain underlying schemata 
which are pre-existing patterns of thought or behavior used in recurrent ways that are readily recognizable to members. The notion of schemata is connected with two other terms, conventions and rituals. The first is defined as those routines or recurrent schematic behaviors which specifically regulate social interaction. <clears throat> but once a convention is adopted by a social network or an institution and reenacts specific values and beliefs and is recognizably performed, it becomes ritual. To give you a practical example, the phrase welcome on board is a widely spread polite rite or passage which signals acceptance in a network. And it is not simply a convention or an etiquette rule because by uttering these words, the speaker symbolically changes the address's status by providing her or him with membership in the network. Uttering these words in a specific institutional setting like in an audience with a king, is a powerful act because the speaker does not speak for him or herself, but instead she or he animates the voice of the network or institution. In short, for Daniel Kada, ritual is a formalized, schematic, conventionalized, and recurrent act, which is relationship forcing. Namely, by operating, it reinforces, transforms in group relationships through a mimetic performance of the ritual. That is to say, the enactment or and reenactment of certain beliefs and values. The ritual is born to the relational history between and across members. In light of this definition, Anik Pat Noster sees etiquette as a set of conventions that form rituals around recurring circumstances, such as presentation, a court, a dance party, a visit, dinner, wedding, funeral, and the like. <clears throat> Considering these studies, I will mostly adopt the word etiquette to define the conventional rules depicted on Assyrian art. This term does not exclude the word ritual but contributes to its creation in specific circumstances. In order to establish a relationship between the two terms, I suggest that when conventional rules are performed and adopted by an institution in recurring circumstances, such as a royal banquet or an audience with a ruler or a deity, and aim at reinforcing a group relationship, then etiquette is embedded in ritual and becomes ritual. Having specified the terminology relying on pragmatics and linguistics, I will now move to highlight how the study of etiquette is not only a trivial or simpli simplistic study of formalities and external trappings of life, but by relying on sociological and anthropological studies, we can understand that etiquette plays a fundamental role in regulating our lives, both in modern and past societies. In detail, from a sociological perspective, etiquette may contribute to the evolutionary success of a group because it implies a collaboration among individuals who have all the capacity to demarcate group membership through symbolic markers, such as dialect, language, cult, religion, clothing, and even etiquette. In other words, etiquette can communicate identity or belonging to a group. In view of this, the study of etiquette from a sociological perspective helps to reveal general social changes in the social structure power, gender, and the construction of the social self. From an anthropological perspective, etiquette and codified rules of conduct shape human relations 
and preserve the integrity of a group through specific strategies. This may be seen particularly by the proxemic distance, both physical and psychological, which the group creates. Such a distance may depend on both evolutionary and cultural factors. For example, disgusting things and the reaction of human beings to disgust might function to orchestrate avoidance of pathogens and parasites, while disease or evil attacks may be avoided by individuals of the same group through the maintenance of distance at the dining table or in public spaces. Hygiene thus becomes an avoidance strategy against infection and an indicator of membership with the result that the lack of such hygiene may lead to a kind of social ostracism from a group. These two research methodologies are being applied in the project I'm working on. And with this presentation, I would like to show you how a sociological and anthropological approach to a scene and art may work to study courtesy, namely conduct and etiquette, and to detect hidden and non-explicit messages in figurative art. In this regard, I decided to focus on the banquet in measuring, since as noted by the famous Judith Martin, alias Miss Manners, and I quote, the dinner table is the center for the teaching and practicing not just of table manners, but a conversation, consideration, tolerance, family feeling, and just about all the other accomplishments of polite society, except the minuet. In fact, no etiquette rules and no rituals are more widely practiced, more formative of social identity, or more differentiating of social groups than the daily habits of dining. The Assyrian banquet is an example of commensality namely the practice of eating and drinking together. <clears throat> the word commensality always recalls a material dimension. Above all, the table, the mensa, the utensils of the meal, the special context where the food and drink are consumed, and the financial contribution of the meal. However, Commensality also involves uh, some immaterial aspects, which, although may be hidden or not stated explicitly in art, they are fundamental in creating and reinforcing social bonds and in generating a sense of belonging to the same community in order to preserve it. It is exactly these two aspects that I would like to outline through the analysis of some immaterial dimensions which the representation of first millennium Assyrian royal banquets, I believe, strives to display and which sociology and anthropology may help to reveal. The best visual evidence of a banquet at the court of the Assyrian king comes from an Assyrian ivory plaque from Fort Shalmaneser in al Kaku, and the reliefs of rooms two and seven in the royal palace of Sargon II and Adu Sharukin. In the main scene, the Assyrian royal banquet is basically portrayed through groups of seated banqueters who face each other across the table with foodstuff, raise beakers to drink or make a toast, and who are surrounded by standing attendants. The king is apparently absent from the palace reliefs. Although he must have been represented somewhere, as in the ivory plaque from Kalku. As already pointed out, these banquet scenes must probably be considered as a direct and positive consequence of specific activities, such as the word and the hand depicted in the lower registers or rooms two and seven. Thus, they probably do not represent daily meals, but exceptional episodes, which were likely organized in the Royal Palace to celebrate and commemorate a specific event. 
to borrow the sociologist Claude Grignon's terminology, the type of commensality which is shown in these scenes can be described first as exceptional because it, is, it celebrates a memorable event that did not take place each day. Second, as institutional, because of its hierarchical nature and the presence of a ruler of the institution, the Assyrian king, who sponsored the banquet. And third, as segregative, because access to the royal building and to particular inner spaces where banquets probably took place was regularly controlled. And those who maintained access to such places were carefully selected. Now, the material dimensions depicted on the Syrian royal banquet scenes comply with a commensality that was exceptional, institutional, and segregative in essence. <clears throat> the arrangement of tables and the position of the banqueters is not accidental, but complies with specific social needs which are dictated by the just described type of commensality. In this regard, it should be noted that semi-fixed features, such as chairs and tables, are not already laid out in the room, but are brought into a room which appears empty at the moment of the repast. This is confirmed not only by the reliefs of the facade of room 2 at Dusharuki, but also by an Assyrian banquet protocol, which describes how, at the beginning of the dinner, when the king enters the room with his magnates, and I quote, the table and the couch for the king are placed opposite the doorway. Also, at the end of the dinner, the magnates rise and remain standing. The tables of the crown prince and the magnates are lifted up. The table of the crown prince and the table before the king are set in motion. This suggests that there may have been a hierarchical order in which both the furniture and banqueters were arranged. Moreover, such use of movable furniture allowed protocol holders to lay out the tables and chairs according to special and new needs deriving from political and social changes. In this connection, the notion that the king was not of equal status with the other participants is reinforced visually on the Kalku ivory plaque, where he is seated apart and is distinguished by his high-baked seat, dress and paraphernalia. Similarly, on the same plaque, the figure immediately in front of the king is visually differentiated by his position and the diadem he wears, which has ribbons attached to it, and is a marker of the crown prince. This suggests that tables closer to the king's table were occupied by the most important and trusted persons by the king. The closer that one was to the king's table, the more important was his position within the Assyrian court hierarchy. Moreover, it is likely that each table represented a specific rank of officials. Notwithstanding such hierarchical organization, a remarkable cohesiveness can be highlighted from the position and arrangement of the banqueters. From an anthropological perspective, we are informed that a setting can offer many types of behavioral opportunities which may facilitate or hinder social behavior. The design of a space and its semi-fixed features can dramatically alter the social affordances relative to the occupants who are disposed to use it. In this respect, the terms social petal and social frugal are environmental psychological concepts used to denote such designs. The basic difference between them lies in the fact that these contrasting social settings facilitate or inhibit social interaction. Thus, a social people room 
tends to bring people together and affords interaction by orienting occupants toward each other. Whereas a social fugal space may have boundary walls and seats which face away from each other, and it tends to discourage meetings or conversations between individuals, thereby inhibiting interaction. The physical setting of the Assyrian banquet in Major is unknown, but it is likely that the largest rooms in the palace may have been the physical venue for such meetings. Tables could be set in line, but they could have been also placed side by side. In either case, what we see in the banquet scenes in a, is a setting closer to a social people arrangement. The aim being to facilitate and promote interaction between banqueters. Such a social people space greatly impacts on a number of sensorial inputs and aspects that cannot be explained by the leaves or text. Sight, olfaction, sound, smell, and one's feel of one's neighbor's breath all combine to signal unmistakable involvement with another body. This arrangement allows the sensation of warmth from the body of the, of the nearby banqueter to create an intimate space. Thighs and elbows are brought into contact. Hands can reach and grasp extremities. And so one is able to hold or grasp the other person. All these aspects were created deliberately by the arrangement of the furniture with a distance between banqueters, perhaps ranging between intimate and personal, according to the anthropologist Edward Hall's categorizations. Personal distance in particular is the limit of physical domination in a very real sense. Beyond it, a person cannot easily get his hands on someone else. Such an intimacy is between banqueters and their arrangement in units of four individuals per table suggest that this was a way to activate and tighten internal solidarity within specific microgroups. Instead, it is likely that the king was seated at a social distance where intimate visual details in the face were not perceived, and nobody could touch the king unless a special effort was taken. At this distance, nonetheless, voice level may be normal and conversations could be conducted at the normal level. The strong feeling of closeness and intimacy also seems to be expressed through minute instances of conduct and etiquette. All the banqueters, including the king, are equated by the same posture. The erect posture, which seems conventional for Assyrians according to the Assyrian visual evidence, was considered to carry positive connotations of appearing agreeable, while holding the head high indicated correctness and dignity, as was suggested by previous studies. Moreover, this posture was an element which expressed reciprocity because it implied direct eye contact between banqueters. In this regard, I would like to point out that the rules of appropriate behavior may be justified by their basis in commonly held moral principles and ideas, perhaps deriving from a military context. Conventions which govern the stances which are maintained at the king's table should not be considered as colorless formal aspects which are represented passively by the artist. Rather, I suspect that these conventions reflected rules, practices and norms of poor conduct that bonded participants to behave in certain ways and created a structure in which banqueters could collectively participate in potentially morally transformative activities.
they represented what sociologists and linguists call moral order, which is the set of expected background features of everyday scenes that members of a social cultural group or relational network take for granted. These seen but unnoticed features are imbued with morality. Namely, they are open to evaluation as appropriate, inappropriate, good, bad, polite, impolite. Because they are familiar to those members that have been sustained and over time changed by the practices of, the, of those members. <clears throat> In a nutshell, I assume that there must have been a strict correlation between conduct rules and morality, which perhaps derived from a basically martial context. One gesture which both banqueters and the king himself perform is the raising of day beakers. And this can be fairly described as a conventionalized way to represent a banquet in the figurative art of Mesopotamia and Syria. People are always depicted drinking and never eating. We don't actually know why the act of drinking was chosen to freeze the repast and thus whether it stood for a subset or extension of food. However, my feeling is that matters of conduct, etiquette and manners can be explanatory options. We can assert with confidence that everyone from the king and queen to the peasant and his wife would eat with their hands. In only two instances, this is clearly shown. On the narrow strip of ivory, where a beardless attendant is holding something in his right hand, perhaps food, to be offered to the banqueter. And another, another example comes from the North Palace of Ashurbanipal and Nineveh, where the Elamite prisoners eat their meals inside an Assyrian camp. The latter perfectly describes and conveys the sensation of being at the dining table. A number of people are sitting together and each is doing what he or she considers necessary. One cleans their hands on their clothes. Banqueters fall greedily on the food. Someone seems to have set down a piece that one had in one's mouth back into the communal dish. Without a towel, one's hands are wiped on one's coat. One offers another a glass or a half-eaten piece of meat with dirty hands and uses them to touch one's ears, nose or eyes. Half of the food falls off the table and hands as it traveled from hands to mouth and from hands to hands. The sensorial experience must have been distasteful as well since the odors of food and of people eating must have emerged during the course of the banquet. Many aspects cannot be readily surmised from this scene, but the chaotic atmosphere that emanates from the banqueters' movement and crowding allows viewers to perceive the very essence of eating together, taking meat from the same dish, wine from the same goblet, and standing close to each other. The scene itself, in short, is not aesthetically pleasing. By contrast, the neo Syrian text informs us that in some context, measures to counteract or conceal the tasteful aspects of the banquet were carefully taken. The so-called protocol for the royal dinner shows that there were more refined forms of this phenomenon in the case of the Assyrian court. And I quote, one special stockroom assistant keeps watch, receives dirty napkins and gives out clean ones, receives dirty handkerchiefs and gives out clean ones. One likely stands before the container of hand water. If water is lacking, it pours water from the hand water. The text continues by reporting that the use of sensors and aromatics must have served for this purpose. 
the chariot driver brings in the censers, placing one to the right of the king and the other to the left of the king at the head of the coach. A lackey gives aromatics. If the aromatics run out, the lackey goes out, brings in an iron shovel, and removes the burnt aromatics with it. A similar order and cleanliness can be seen in the iconographic sources as well. <clears throat> Taken all together, these measures can be conceived as solutions adopted by high-ranking groups to make banquets as pleasant as possible. They concern the elimination of what may have been described as disgusting for some or embarrassing for others. To conclude, I understand the omission of images showing people eating at the table with what was considered to be repugnant to see. By contrast, the representation of people drinking was considered a very elegant act to admire. Accordingly, the scene showing the Elamite prisoners eating must have been perceived as a humiliating act by any viewer. The omission of the eating act is well counterbalanced by the representation of the drinking act, and especially by the way that the bowl of beaker was held, which was most likely considered an elegant performance. First, what emerges is that such a gesture diminishes the differences between banqueters, since raising beakers may have meant that men are toasting one another, and this very scene of conviviality made a partaker similar in status. Now, if we compare some Syro Anatolian examples showing people drinking with the drinking gestures depicted on a Syrian reliefs, we will note that both the king and banqueters balance a bowl or beaker in one hand, making use of all the fingertips. As far as I know, the only description of such a mode of drink consumption comes from Xenophon's Sinopedia. In the context of an imaginary discussion between the young Cyrus the Great and his grandfather as the Aegis, King of the Medes. This passage reads as follows, and as the Aegis replied with a jest. Do you not see, said he, how nicely and gracefully he pours the wine? Now the cup bearers of those kings perform their office with fine airs. They pour in the wine with neatness and then present the goblet, conveying it with three fingers and offer it in such a way as to place it most conveniently in the grasp of the one who is to drink. In this regard, my feeling is that this elegant manner was strictly connected with the meaning of wine in the Syrian society. Within the Assyrian imagery, drinking always appears as a shade moment. The drink consumed is probably wine, which was greatly appreciated as an emblem of power and prosperity at the Assyrian court. Wine was also connected to the divine world. Beyond its significance, the representation of drinking also appears to be intimately associated with the institution of hospitality which places the donor, the king, in a position of superiority and the receiver in a position of subordination. The proffering of drink can highlight the king's capacity for agricultural production and determines, determines his ability to host great social events. In sum, in the Assyrian society, wine, if possessed, was promptly and duly flaunted through its depiction as a drink shed and consumed through luxury items. In this regard, I believe that the best and most natural way to flaunt this will was to physically exhibit the container by holding it on one's fingertips. This elegant mannerism was the corresponding physical way to display the access to wine and its social consequences. <clears throat> 
in association with these aspects and the system of a minutely codified etiquette. This process of formal selection and the cohesiveness of banqueters is complemented by another immaterial dimension, that of hygiene. By hygiene, I refer to the basic dictionary definition, which is understood as the condition or practices as of cleanliness conducive to health. Such a definition applies naturally to the external world, where there seems to have been great awareness of good hygiene practices, and they role in reducing the spread of disease. The already quoted Asinian Banquet Protocol text reveals the high levels of hygiene which existed in the banquet environment in its reference to the frequent proffering of napkins and handkerchiefs, and especially to the container of hand water, which was constantly supervised by a special lackey. In such a context, the use of water should not be conceived as a means to reach cultic purity, but to prevent the spread of diseases. In fact, a correlation between illness and clean water is often emphasized in Assyrian letters, where we read that the clean water with which the king regularly washes his hands in the washbowl should not be hot. The rush will soon be gone. A correlation between illness and water is emphasized in a letter sent by a governor who reports on the deportation of some people in a city where the water is apparently strong and dangerous for people. As to what the king ordered, bring 10 Yasubian households into Kashpuna. The water is strong there, the people will become ill. In addition, it seems that the proffering of good water even to deportees reflected a kind of attention and care of the king towards his people. And this can be seen in a letter concerning deportees who are said to be brought into a city where the water is good. I impressed upon the deputies that it was a royal common that they should bring pe the people into fortified places where there is good water. By contrast, the inaccessibility to good and clean water led to a lack of good hygiene and implied a kind of social ostracism. This is what I understand by reading the letters sent from a Babylonian official who complains about unjust treatment. His appeal to the king has not been heard and he has been deprived of his property accordingly. It thus states that since last year, nobody gives me food to eat. Hunger and thirst have befallen me. I go and drink water from a well. I wash my feet there, and I go up to keep the watch of the king, my lord. Not having access to good water and cleanliness meant becoming ill. This in turn was probably perceived as the loss of the king's support. This aspect complies with the typical forms of segregative commensality, where there is a remarkable necessity for the group's individuals, we, to preserve their purity by protecting their bodies and the food they consume from the stain and untoward pollutions which others, the not we, may inflict. In conclusion, what emerges from this analysis is that both in reality and in iconography, there was an effort to implement and represent those strategies that were carefully uh, chosen to preserve the integrity of a very small group of people. These strategies contributed towards the evolutionary success of the group. Through contact and etiquette rules, a society somehow formed and held together. Sharing and incorporating food implies the incorporation of the partaker into the community 
and simultaneously defines his or her place within it. In this regard, the sociologist Passy Falk highlights the bidirectional value of the eating mouth, both in incorporating the food of the community into one's body and being eaten into the community. This bond is created primarily by sharing. However, I would emphasize that, especially within an institutional and segregative form of commensality, which exists to celebrate a common success or exceptional event, conducted etiquette rules contribute to transform a banquet into a ritual and work to incorporate or eat partakers into the community and thereby forge, reinforce, and protect the integrity of a single group. At the same time, defining the place occupied by each individual within the same group. Socially speaking, the members of a senior royal society were what they ate. All these elements are not explicitly expressed in art, but can somehow be detected with some tools offered by anthropology and sociology, which I hope this lecture has successfully applied on a Syrian art and which I hope will expand our understanding on Near Eastern art. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ludovico, for your very nice, interesting presentation. Um, yeah, really impressive. The very close look yeah, on what is presented in art and also with the textual evidence um, to it. Um, yeah, I think we um, maybe you stop sharing your screen so that's better than yes. that we can view each other. And Excellent. I stopped now recording. Okay.